Well, good morning. And I loved what we sang this morning, didn't you? It was just unbelievable. We sang above and below me, before and behind me, in every eye that sees me, Christ be all around me. That's the point of the sermon. That's what we're here to talk about this morning. That when people look at us, what they see is Christ. What they see is the love of Christ. And I hope that what you encounter this morning is the extraordinary love of God that he has for you that so overflows that it causes everyone around you to say, that's what the love of Christ looks like. But let's start off with some serious questions. Who here remembers school? Okay, just so you know, that's a trick question, so I can find out who's awake and who's asleep. (laughs) Um, I know there are like groups on both sides of me, the youth that are saying, uh, yeah, that was like two days ago. Thanks for the reminder. Um, Who remembers their English classes? Do you ever remember reading things in English that you're thinking to yourself, why do public funds or private funds or someone's funds go to making me read this? (laughs) Uh, Don't tell my high school English teachers, but some of that stuff actually stuck with me. And one of them was an assignment that I had to read this book here, Death of a Salesman by Arthur Miller. It's a play. And at the end of this play, you have a family that is gathered around a grave. And the person in the grave is the salesman. It's the dad of the family. And this dad has two sons. And one of the sons, standing at the grave, summarizes his dad's life with this statement. He had all the wrong dreams. We all did. That I remember nothing else about that play. But I will never forget that line. The dad spent his whole life striving and working to achieve a dream that didn't matter. What he valued as fruitful in the end turned out to be worthless. Do you ever think about that? You ever think to yourself, ask to yourself, ask yourself, do I have the right dreams? What I'm striving for, is it truly fruitful? Is it truly worthless? I think we all have a built-in fear that we don't want anyone at the end of our lives saying we had all the wrong dreams. We don't want the closing statement to be about our life that our life was worthless, it was fruitless. And as you saw in today's passage, has been read it for us, the issue that this passage is dealing with, it's pointing us towards what is involved in having a fruitful life. We're continuing our series called The Upper Room. The Upper Room is the place where Jesus had his last evening with his disciples. This is his last teaching time with them as he prepares them for the fact that he is just in a few hours is going to be arrested. And when he's arrested, that's going to lead to his crucifixion, which will lead to his resurrection. And 40 days after the resurrection, he will be ascended to the Father. And the disciples are not going to see him day in and day out like they have for the previous three years. And he is preparing them for that moment. And this morning's passage is probably familiar to you if you grew up in church. But here's something that's often missed when we look at this passage. What this passage is really talking about are two different ways to live. Two different approaches to relating to God. And the two approaches come down to this. 
You are either drawing life from Jesus or you're trying to draw life from something else. And inevitably, what that something else is going to come down to is your own efforts, your own work, your own achievements. And Jesus is developing, Jesus tells us through the use of an analogy, analogy of, of vines and branches, that the only way that you can be fruitful, the only way to produce lasting fruit is if we are connected to the vine. And those that are not connected to the vine will in the end be fruitless. Now, the analogy of the divine or the vine and branches actually divides into two different parts. The first part focuses on Jesus as the source of life. The second part explains the analogy and shows the way of life that comes from being connected to Jesus. And I want to look at those two sections in order, and then I want to wrap up by talking about how Jesus teaching how this analogy actually fleshes itself out in daily life. But let's start by just walking through the analogy and how Jesus unfolds it. The first half of the analogy is in verses 1 through 8. And there Jesus identifies that the source of life that we are to have is found when we remain in him. And I want us to catch that there are actually two different contrasts going on in these verses. There's a contrast between fruitful and fruitless branches, and that's easy to see. But there's another contrast that's very subtle and that we're likely to miss because we're not a part of their culture. And it starts off right away in verse 1. When Jesus says he is the true vine, he is drawing a contrast that the disciples would have caught immediately. One of the most common symbols of the nation of Israel at this time was the vine. In fact, when Israel printed their own coins, guess what image they put on their coins? It was a vine. The Old Testament regularly talks about Israel in terms of Israel being a vine. And here's what's fascinating. Every time, the Old Testament talks about Israel as a vine. It does so to make a point. And the point is that Israel is not producing the fruit that God wants them to produce. So when Jesus starts this analogy, every Jew in earshot would know that Jesus is making a contrast between himself and Israel. Now, to understand that contrast more fully, you need to know how Israel approached life with God. If you asked any Jew at the time how to glorify God and have a kind of fruitful life that God wanted you to have, they would say, stay connected to Israel. Stay connected to the people of God. Be a good Jew and do the things that made the Jews unique, right? Such as celebrate the Sabbath. Follow the rules that make you unique such as the hand-washing rules. Keep the rituals that you need to keep. Keep the festivals and times of worship that you're supposed to keep. And if you do these things, and if you do them well, you earn God's favor. I love the last hymn we sang. Great is thy faithfulness. Did you catch the line? All I have needed Thy hand hath provided. There is a whole system of relating to God that says that's not true. There's a whole system of relating to God that a lot of people, maybe even most people in our society today subscribe to, that say it really comes down to you in your works, in your efforts. Instead of saying it is God that provides all my needs, including my need for a right relationship with him, including my need to be connected with him, it really, really comes down to what I do and how I live. It's about working hard 
to be the kind of person that God likes to hang out with. And I do that by following the rules and being involved in church. There are two vines. There's a false vine that says, as the, as the Israelites of Jesus' day believed, that the way that you find acceptance with God is by working hard and following all the rules. And that's what Israel tried for years. And God kept telling them again and again that it's not working. They couldn't be good enough. But there's a second vine, and that's the true vine, who is Jesus. And the point that Jesus is making is that life comes from him. Jesus' point in verses 1 through 3 is that the Father himself cares for and watches over the vine and the branches. He shapes the branches. He positions them so they can produce the most fruit. And sometimes that means removing branches. But Jesus reassures the disciples in verse 3 that they are not the branches that will be removed. They have been made clean. They are not the ones that will be cut off. And then in verses 4 and 5, Jesus explains the difference between the good branches and the worthless branches. The branches that abide in Jesus bear fruit. The branches that don't abide in Jesus don't bear fruit. The Greek word that's translated abide means to persist, to stay where you are. And Jesus paints a picture of branches being connected to him and drawing life from him. When we abide in Jesus, we look to him for strength and wisdom. We abide in him when we remain faithful, even when it's hard. We abide in him and we are obedient, even when it's not popular. That's what it means to draw life from him. If I'm angry at someone, it's easy for me to sit and think about ways that this person has wronged me or ways that I can get even. I can dwell on negative thoughts about that person. Anyone here ever do that? Anyone here relate to that? Thanks for being honest. (laughs) Your mom's sitting right next to you. We all do that. Why do we do that? Why do we do that? Because it makes us feel a little bit better about ourselves. It feels like it is giving us life. But Jesus would say, that's not where life comes from. That's not abiding in me. Abiding in Jesus in a situation like that means working through forgiveness. It means asking the Lord to help you desire that other person's good. Our path, that path, might feel extremely hard. The path of holding resentment might feel like it's life-giving. Jesus would say the path of forgiveness is the path that produces life. Any branch that is truly drawing its life from Jesus is going to produce fruit. Jesus doesn't clearly define what the fruit is for those who abide in him, but he seems to indicate two things. It's reflecting his character, especially his love, and that gets developed in the second part. And it's also drawing people to him. A quick point about verse 6. Verse 6 is not saying that if you mess up, God is going to reject you. The point is that there are branches that look like they are part of the vine, but they aren't. And I would suggest to you that those are people who have never been true followers of Christ. There are people who keep all the words, they follow all the rituals, they might attend church every Sunday, but they are not drawing life from Jesus. They are still trying to draw life from their own efforts at goodness, their own efforts at trying to please God by doing all the right things. And that is being connected to the false vine. And the disciples are hours away from a living demonstration of exactly what Jesus is talking about here. Because in a few hours, Someone who has been with them, who has looked like a follower of Jesus for years, is about to walk into the Garden of Gethsemane with a group of soldiers to arrest Jesus. You may not know this about Anne. You can pray for her. Anne has a significant addiction problem. It's appropriate for you to laugh at that. Uh, During certain times of the year, uh, that would be pretty much most of the year, 
um, she'll just suddenly be gone. She'll just kind of wander away and you won't see her for hours. And we have stopped calling the police. Um, we've stopped sending out search parties because we know that she'll eventually come back. And, and when she does, she'll walk into the house and she'll say, and it's, the line is pretty consistent, there are babies in the back of the car. That is her way of saying, I went to the nursery. And I'm not talking about FBC's nursery. <laughs> Anne has a serious gardening addiction. This is our backyard a couple years ago. Um, we have been, when I say we, I mean Anne, has been working on our backyard for about 20 years. This is her form of exercise. It's her form of therapy. This is her happy place. Every year, she buys lots of babies. <laughs> and she plants them, and she weeds, and she nurtures, and she frets over the plants. She has full-length conversations with them. Sometimes they know more about what's going on in our house than I do. But here's the thing. As much as she loves gardening, as much as she loves working on the backyard, if you came over to our house today, it's not likely that she's going to take you back there. Why? Because there are a lot of dead, scraggly things laying around this time of year. But wait. Wait a few months, and you will see Anne in her glory. Why? Because the garden is beautiful. That is the picture that verses 7 and 8 are painting of the Father. He is glorified when the branches that he cares for are beautiful, when they produce fruit, when people look at us and say, that's a follower of Jesus. And when it talks about the father giving what is asked, think of it this way. If Anne walks into the backyard in the morning and one of the roses stops her and tells her he's hungry, the first thing is that Anne will completely miss how bizarre it is that a rose is talking to her. What she will immediately do, instead of calling the news, is go and get plant food, and feed the rose. Why? Because that's what you do with a request like that from something or someone you love and care for. The person who abides in Jesus desires to grow in Jesus, to become more like Jesus by following his teaching and his example. And that's what it means to have his words abide in you. The Father will always give that person what she asks for because what she is asking for brings health to that person and it brings glory to God. So here's where the analogy has taken us so far. Jesus is the only true source of life. If you are connected with him, your life will produce the fruit that glorifies the Father. But there is another option. And that other option is the system of rules and rituals that the people of Israel tried to use to earn God's acceptance and please him. And the problem was that trying to work harder and do better to please God always, always, always ended in failure. And we are surrounded by people who struggle every single day trying to be good enough, trying to do all the right things. So they can be good enough for God, for others, and for themselves. In verse 9, Jesus begins to flesh out the analogy. So in verse one, verses 1 through 8, he talks about remaining in him. But notice that the language changes a little bit when we get to verse 9. Now the command is to remain in Jesus' love. And he's talking about a way of life that is lived out by someone whose source of life is in Jesus. The command is to stay 
in the love that we already have from Jesus. And it's important to stop for a second and get that order right. We don't gain his love, we have his love. In other words, we don't obey and live the Christian life to earn God's love. That is the view of the false vine. That was Israel's view. We obey and live the Christian life because we are loved by Jesus exactly as he is loved by the Father. And stop and think about that statement for a second. How does the Father love Jesus? Perfectly. There's not a hint, not a hint of selfishness. There are no hidden agendas. The Father's not trying to use Jesus to get his own needs met. The Father never looks at Jesus and says, what about me? When is it my turn? And there is only one reasonable response when you encounter love like that. You cling to it as tightly as you can. And the way that Jesus does that is by obeying the Father. And the way that we cling to that love is by obeying Jesus. So let's be clear again about what this verse is not saying. Jesus is not saying that if you fail to obey a commandment, he's going to stop loving you. If Jesus love were based on our performance and how good we are, he would never have gone to the cross for us. But you and I can choose to live every day as if Jesus doesn't love us. Right? You can choose to live as if he doesn't want the best for you. You can choose to live as if he gives up on you every time you make a mistake. But none of those things are true. But you can still choose to live just like that. Nothing will stop you from living as if you're outside of the love of God. But if you live clinging to that love, the result is joy. One definition of this Greek word that's translated joy is that it's like your heart is dancing or shouting. Another definition linked it to the feeling you have at a wedding. When I do premarital counseling, one of the things that I will tell a groom is there is nothing that I can tell you, there is nothing that anyone can tell you that is going to prepare you for the moment that you are standing down here and those doors open and you see your bride for the first time in her wedding dress and she is coming down that aisle. Nothing will prepare you for that moment. Now, as it turns out, I've never been a bride. And it's unlikely that I will be. But I suspect it's very similar in that case. I suspect there is nothing like that moment that those doors open and that bride begins to walk down the aisle looking at her groom. That is the feeling that is being described by this word joy. You know, there's a common misconception about how we relate to God. And it's a misconception that I consciously speak against in many, many, if not most of my sermons. So let me just name it right now. It's the idea that the reason that we have a relationship with God, the reason we obey him, is so that God will give us the American dream. That is pervasive in our Christian culture. It is the idea that if we follow the right rules, God's going to give us financial success. If we follow certain other rules, God's going to give us career success. And then we have the list of rules that we need to follow so we will have family success. In that way of thinking, the goal of the Christian life is the American dream. Do you see what this passage is actually telling us brings us joy? It's not our finances. It's not our career. It's not our relationships. As much as those things may be blessed, what really brings us joy is that we abide in Christ. The great joy of the Christian life is not the stuff that we get or the comfort of life. It is the joy that you have from experiencing the love of God no matter what life gives you. No matter how life might be going well or falling apart. 
So how do you remain in Jesus' love? That's what Jesus summarizes in verse 12, and he really expands on it in the rest of the paragraph. The same love that was passed from the Father to Jesus and that then passed from Jesus to us, we are to pass to one another. That's how we remain in Jesus' love. How do we know how to do this? Well, you look at what Jesus did. How do you know how to relate to someone when they hurt you deeply? Well, you look at what Jesus did and how he related to Peter when Peter denied him. How do you love someone who is making horrible, horrible choices in life? Well, you look at what Jesus did and how he related to Zacchaeus or how he related to the woman caught in adultery. Sometimes we need to look at ourselves and say, what does Jesus think about my hypocrisy or my judgmentalism. And we look at how Jesus related to the Pharisees. But we won't go there. That's not all you look at. You also look at the wider commands and principles of Scripture. Take lying or stealing, for example. There's a reason we don't do those things. And it's not because we're trying to keep God from being mad at us. We don't lie or steal because... Not lying and not stealing is what it looks like to love others the way Jesus loves us. When we love others the way that Jesus loves us, we experience the joy of remaining in Jesus' love. We experience life with Jesus. Jesus is the source of spiritual life. We must stay connected to that life through faithful dependence. We depend on Jesus for our strength and wisdom. We ask the Father for what we need to live that life, and we depend on him, knowing that he will supply it. And the person for whom Jesus is the source of their life has a very identifiable way of life. They are faithfully obedient, and that means they love others the way that Jesus loves them. The idea that someone could look at your life and say, this is what Jesus' love looks like in action is the picture that Jesus is creating. So let's wrap up by taking a few seconds and seeing what the abiding life looks like in actual practice. I created this chart when I was going through this passage because this chart, and you can see the chart, that's good. um, It kind of helped me track what is Jesus actually saying through this analogy. And the point here is that there are two possible ways of life. There are two possible sources of life. Jesus is the only true source of life. He is perfect. His life that he lived, the death that he died on the cross, the resurrection, those are all that we need for God's acceptance. It doesn't matter what you face, you know that you are loved by him. But there is another way that you can try to find life. There is another source that you can look to, and that is yourself. And that's the old vine. And that is the thinking that it is up to you to make and keep God happy. Most people today live in the old vine. They might look like they are following Jesus. They might go to church. They might do Christian things. They might avoid all the right sins. But what they're really doing is relying on themselves. They think that what they need to do is to work hard enough and be good enough, and God will like them. In their minds, their acceptance by God, others, and themselves comes down to their effort. Jesus never really comes into the picture. A source of life is going to lead to a way of life. The life with Jesus, the life that has Jesus as its source, is a life that is lived in dependence upon him. It is a life that is lived in obedience to him, and it is a life that is grounded in his love for us that it overflows to the love of other people. This is the life that comes from Jesus, and it is a life that keeps you experiencing Jesus' love day in and day out. But if what you look towards the source of your life is yourself, if you are connected to the false vine, what it leads to is a life of independence, It leads to a life of performance where you think it's up to your performance 
to make yourself and keep yourself acceptable to God. And it is a life of self-focus. Because when you succeed, you will be proud of yourself. And when you fail, you will beat yourself up. You will work every day to prove to God, to others, and yourself that you are good enough. That you are good enough to be loved. That you are good enough to be valued. And when you blow it, if you care at all about what God thinks, it just leads you to work harder or ultimately to give up. And there are two ultimate outcomes. If you're connected to the true vine, the outcomes are fruitfulness. Fruitfulness is a life that looks like Christ and a life that draws people to him. God is glorified and you experience joy. The result of life outside of Jesus is fruitlessness. The only person who's glorified is yourself. And it results in death. So what does this actually look like in practice? What happens when someone who lives in the false vine sins? Well, they may not care at all. But if they do care, they'll respond by trying to earn God's acceptance by working harder and doing better. But someone who abides in Jesus knows they already have God's love and acceptance because of Jesus' death on the cross. Their sins have been paid for. So they respond by, to sin by grieving. They tell God that they are sorry and they ask to be fully brought back into a healthy relationship with him. And then they ask for God's help to live rightly. They depend on Jesus every step of the way, both for the relationship with God and the ability to live out that relationship with God. What they desire, what they want most is to please God. And when they hit a road bump, when they sin and make a mistake, what they desire is to get back on track. We have a lot of people in this room that are facing very, very significant challenges. Some are health, some are relational, some are family. I try to ask myself the question, what does it look like if you're in one of those situations to abide in Christ? If you're depending on yourself, if you are abiding in the false vine, here's what you're going to do. You're going to do whatever it takes to fix the situation. And when I say whatever it takes, I mean including things that you know are displeasing to God. And what you will rely on are your own resources, your experience, skills, and knowledge, and maybe those of people around you. But ultimately, you see yourself as the final, ultimate problem solver. My family blew up, literally blew up, when I graduated from college. We had close family members that were not speaking to each other. My mother said to me at one point that I was making her choose between the person that she was having an affair with and me. And she chose him. We did not speak for six months. I was right in the middle of trying to hold different family members together who were not talking to each other, who were angry at each other, and who looked at me as the center point to hold it all together. And I want to tell you that as I look back on it, there were a lot of times that although I was connected to Christ, I was actually living is if I was connected to the false vine. You see, the way I handled that situation is I told people what they wanted to hear, even if I knew it wasn't true. I was extremely confident, overly confident, that I was smart enough, talented enough, strong enough to fix all these relationships and hold everything together. I was not obedient I was not depending on Christ. I was depending on my own skills and talents. And that is not what abiding in Christ looks like. Abiding in Christ means that options that go against God's commands 
are not open to you. Your experience and skills and knowledge will be very important, but they are not the ultimate game changer. The ultimate game changer is going to be Christ. And you acknowledge that and you recognize that and you depend upon that by going to the Lord in prayer and saying, this is bigger than what I can handle. This is bigger than me. I need your help. May your fruit be produced in my life as you use my gifts and experience, as you use my knowledge and my talents. And you just keep asking for his wisdom to know what is right to do. And you ask for his strength to do what is right when you know it. And you ask for him to be the ultimate problem solver. That doesn't mean you're inactive. But at the end of the day, you recognize who gets the glory. When Jesus talks about people who are not connected to him, as I said before, he's talking about people who are never Christians. They just look like it. So what I don't want is to create the fear that if you blow it, somehow you get disconnected from the vine and rejected by God. But here's the reality. If you are a Christian, you are going to have moments like I did with my family where you are going to live not as if you're connected to the vine, but as if you are connected to the false vine. And so the question is for you, what today are you looking to for your source of life? We all want a life that has purpose. We want a fruitful life. But what is the fruitful life? It's the life that looks like Jesus and points people to him. How do we have a fruitful life? By abiding in Jesus as the source of, for our life. What does that mean? That means that we follow his teaching and his example. We trust that he can give us the strength and wisdom that we lack and we ask for it and that we depend on him to work in and through us no matter what we are facing. How does abiding in Christ get lived out as a way of life? It's obedience and it's loving one another. And it's loving one another the way that Jesus loved us. And that's really the point of the message. We follow Jesus to a fruitful life. Jesus is telling this to the disciples because they are hours away from Jesus not being physically present and then days away from Jesus not being physically present ever again. And he is making the statement that you can still follow him and have a fruitful life. There are, of course, two vines. And the other vine, the false vine, is the vine that most people in the world connect to. It's the vine that says life comes from what you achieve and how well you follow the rules. And that fundamentally leaves it up to you to make yourself good enough for God, good enough for others, and good enough for yourself. And in the end, what will be said about you is that you had all the wrong dreams. So how do we respond to this? I want to suggest four things that you can do. Two of them you'll recognize right away. Share, again, just always want to remind you, use the discussion questions as a means of connecting with others. Go back and reread John 15, 1 through 17, and make two lists. Make a list of what it says about Jesus, and make a list of what it says about the Father. Then I would encourage you to engage in daily prayer. Ask Jesus to produce life in and through you. And then the last one is really a, um, an encouragement for you to ask for help. If you want to know more what it means to follow Jesus, if you want to know what it looks like to abide in Christ, maybe you don't have a relationship with him at all. Maybe you have a relationship, but you realize you've been living as if you're connected to the false vine. Mark that on there, and we will take steps to help you abide in Christ. Jesus' love for us is amazing. He calls us to remain in that love and to let it overflow. I'm going to invite the prayer team to come forward.
and this is a group of men and women that want to pray with you in whatever way you need or desire to know God better, to abide in Jesus, and to remain in his love. Whether that's in a situation you're facing with health or finances or work, family, or just you want to know Jesus better, these folks are here to pray with you. Would you stand with me as we close in prayer? Heavenly Father, we have been reminded this morning that your love for us through Jesus is beyond what we can imagine. And what we have been called to do is to express that love for others. As we sang, Lord, we ask that above and below us, before and behind us, Lord, to every single eye that sees us, may they see Christ. In every angle at which they look at our lives, may they see the love of your Son for us poured out in our love for them. But Lord, even as we say this, we acknowledge that one of the points of this passage is that we are dependent on you. And so, Lord, we come to you humbly and in dependence and ask that you would help us to accomplish what you have called us to do. Help us to remain connected to your son. Help us to live out the truth of that. And we need your help right now. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.